Hello and welcome to World War II Part 3. So we left off in Part 2, okay, with the partition of Poland by the Germans and Soviets. Um, I also covered the rapid campaign in Poland that saw Poland destroyed as a country effectively in four weeks and um, how the Polish army was completely unprepared for the tactics of Blitzkrieg. So after those events in Poland, okay, with the Russians moving in um, and the partition, um, it left kind of a stalemate for a time in the East. You know, there were the deals with Estonia, um, Latvia, um, etc., etc., that I discussed with Germans gaining ports, Soviets gaining land. Um, there were a whole number of treaties being signed and everything else. But the next major major battle okay to take place the next major event to me was um the admiral graf Spee's run and the battle of river plate also at this time um around november was the beginning of what is known as the winter war 1939 1940 between the finns and the soviets so before I go there, okay, before I cover the first major naval engagement and talk a bit about the first beginnings of the war at sea, um, I just wanted to go over um, the materials of the German Navy um, before we start, because even though Hitler and his government and military have been very successful um, in creating um, a modern land army comprising, you know, excellent artillery for its time, um, fast tanks, um, you know, great combat tactics. The Luftwaffe, of course, were a fully modernised air force, a match for any air force at this point in the world, um, even the UK's air force. But the one weakness in Germany's military arsenal was the Navy. Um, and part of the reason for that is the Germans had um, a plan of building their Navy to a point where it could rival the Royal Navy. But sadly, that was not due to be finished until, I think, 1941 or 1942. Um, but in 1939, Hitler would wait no longer for war. So when he went to war, the German Navy was actually the weakest arm of the German armed forces. Now, the German Navy, okay, comprised, okay, the Gneisenau, okay, um, a battleship, and the Scharnost. There were also the battleships Admiral Graf Spee, um, Pitchard, and the Scheer, and the Deutschland, which, if I remember, would be later renamed the Lutzow, um, because Hitler did not want a ship being risked at sea um, that carried the name of the Fatherland, so the Deutschland would be renamed um, the Lutzow in a short time to come. Now, as well as that, Germany had cruisers, okay? They had the heavy cruiser Hipper, um, they had cruisers the Emden, the Köln, the Konigsberg, the Leipzig, the Nuremberg, and the Karlsruhe, okay? And he also had 21 destroyers. Hitler's main weapon um, on top of his surface ships was the 159 um, submarines that were operational um, at the start of the war. And really, it's the war against the submarines, you know, after incidents like the Battle of River Plate, the hunt for the Bismarck that I'll cover later. Um, it really was these kind of incidents what made Germany not be too risky with the Navy because they realised, you know, they knew before the start of war, but they realised very quickly that the Royal Navy's reputation was founded, that it was the most powerful Navy in the world. And the German, you know, naval chiefs just realised that they couldn't combat and defeat the Royal Navy at sea. The only way they would have any hope of defeating the Royal Navy in a pitched battle was with the support of land-based air units, which could not always be guaranteed so the Germans became very trepid about you know risking any of the ships especially um, after what happened to the pocket battleship Graf Spee um, at River Plate so the German Navy was not entirely too powerful now the British Navy by comparison um, comprised okay 12 battleships okay Britain had 12 battleships um, to Germany's two they also had three battle cruisers um, the UK had seven aircraft carriers um, 15 heavy and 40 five light cruisers 184 destroyers and 58 submarines and there was an entire naval plan to build even more up to a further 10 battleships um, eight aircraft carriers 25 cruisers and 30 destroyers so that was in the planning for the years upcoming to also add to the weight of the royal navy so the royal navy um, was immensely powerful and germany um, i'm afraid to say at this time was just not capable of matching that now, as people know, the other day I did document, okay, on the 30th of September, after the end of the Polish campaign, how the German pocket battleship Graf Spee um, sank the British steamship Clement. 
Okay. Now, already by this point, nearly 200,000 tons of merchant shipping have been lost um, because Hitler realised one of the ways to attack the UK and other areas was to attack the merchant ships, which would result in the merchant ships being armed and later escorted, etc., etc. But at this early stage in the war, the Admiral Graf Spee got ahead okay, and launched its kind of raiding on merchant shipping. So, the first phase war at sea, okay, up to end of December 1939, um, you know, closed with um, 115, okay, 115 um, merchantmen ships sunk uh, with a tonnage of over 400,000 tons of shipping. That's only by the end of 1939, okay, the U-boats already started taking a massive toll, you know, by um, the fact there were only four ships um, you know, in one convoy that survived one convoy run. Now, interestingly, the Royal Navy, one of its main um, weapons against the U-boats was what was known as ASDIC equipment, okay? ASDIC equipment, that is Allied Submarine Detection Investigation Committee, okay? Uh, which was known um, in other parts of the world as SONAR, okay? So the UK Navy had SONAR, which greatly helped um, in the tackling of U-boats. Another major um, problem um, that the um, Allies had, i.e. UK had now after um, Poland's fallen and just France and the UK really remaining in Europe at the moment, was the threat of the magnet uh, magnetic mine. That nearly tongue-tied me. I'll just have a quick drink. Mm -hmm. So, right, I've had a quick drink. So, basically, okay, the German pocket battleships, okay, and going into the Battle um, of River Plate. Now, let us go through, okay, the events where I left off. Okay, I left off um, on the 18th of October. Okay, now, okay, let us crack on, okay. So, on the 27th of October, um, 1939, Belgium proclaimed its neutrality. Um, and then on the 30th, 30th of October, the USSR announces that it's formally annexing um, the occupied Polish territories. Um, and actually, Germany and... Um, Latvia signed a treaty, okay, for the evacuation of Germans from the Baltic region. Now, on October 31st, okay, the Royal Navy's hunt for the Admiral Graf Spee is prosecuted worldwide, okay. Four battleships, 14 cruisers and five aircraft carriers are engaged in the hunt for the Graf Spee. I will cover the Battle of River Plate in a bit more detail shortly. Now, on November 1st, okay, the free city of Danzig and the Polish Corridor are officially annexed to the Reich, okay, together with the frontier territories um, ceded to Poland in 1919 under the Treaty of Versailles. Now, October 3rd, okay, talks are continuing um, in Moscow between Russia and Finland on the Soviet request that we will go through um, for territorial changes, border changes, and slight annexations of territory. Okay, now that of course would lead into the winter war. Now, also on the 3rd of September, okay, the United States of America um, amended its law neutrality, okay, um, despite being strongly isolationist still, um, you know, um, with public opinion in the United States. Uh, basically, the United States starts to hold out, you know, um, offers of support, okay, to the Western Allies. And on 7th of November, Queen um, Wilhelmina um, of the Netherlands and Leopold III of Belgium. Belgium, um, issue an appeal for peace, offering themselves as mediators between the two sides in conflict. But by this time, Adolf Hitler has absolutely zero um, interest in peace. Now, on November the 8th, okay, there is another false flag. Now, people will remember um, the story I told about the Polish radio station um, on August 31st, August 30th, okay, um, basically some German security forces um, attacked um, um, a German radio station dressed up as Polish forces and they screamed anti-German insults um, down the radio um, before retreating a false flag. Okay, Hitler launches another false flag, okay, he gives secret instructions, okay, that a bomb to be exploded in the Berdebrau Keller, okay, which is a famous place in Munich, which was one of the shrines Okay, and one of the birthplaces of Nazism. So Joseph Goebbels, okay, um, accuses a Brit British intelligence service of being responsible for the attack. Okay, Britain is the scapegoat. The Germans state that the Britons have planted a bomb in the the shrine of Nazism, one of founding beds of Nazism, and basically, okay, they actually. 
um, name a German, Otto Strasser, okay, a former Nazi um, who opposed Hitler um, and he fled abroad in 1933. Now, this charge that brought against Strasser enables Hitler to eliminate once and for all any remaining sources of internal opposition in Germany. You know, the left wing, um, his recent neutral alliance with USSR, um, despite overwhelming support for the Nazi regime, you know, enhanced by the campaign in Poland, which destroyed a million man army in four weeks. You know, the Fuhrer knows he still has opponents in Germany um, and needed to deal with them. So on October 13th, okay, Chamberlain and Daladier of France refused the offer of mediation by Netherlands and Belgium, you know, and um, Hitler will follow suit very quickly. On November 13th, okay, King Carol of Romania offers himself as a secret mediator um, between the two sides. And November 13th is also the day um, when negotiations are broken off between Finland and Russia. Um, I will actually go through that in a bit more detail later. So on November 14th, Hitler rejects the mediation offer also. Um, So... France and Britain and now Hitler have rejected the offer um, from the Netherlands and Belgium for peace talks. And also on November 16th, um, King Carol of Romania, um, the various sides also reject his offer, um, you know, of talking to create a ceasefire. Now, on November 19th, OK, Churchill proposes to mine the waters of the Rhine between Strasbourg um, and the river Lauter um, using mine laying aircraft. OK, on 21st of November, the British cruiser Belfast hits a magnetic mine and is severely damaged. So, basically, OK, let's have a look now. On November 23rd, OK, um, in the evening, um, a German plane um, is seen um, over the UK coast and it's dropping parcels. OK. Now, basically, these parcels are retrieved, okay, when the tide goes out, okay, and the British staff sent to investigate um, realise that they are submerged magnetic mines. So, Hitler, you know, starts by, end, towards end of November, of laying magnetic mines um, around the coast of Britain, okay? Now, on 23rd of November, the British armed merchant ship, okay, the um, Raoul Pindi, um, on patrol between Iceland and the Faroe Islands, is sunk by the German battlecruiser Scharnhorst, um, which, um, accompanied by the Gneisenau, um, have gone into the Atlantic to attack British convoys. Now, the loss of the Raoul, uh, Raoul Pindi is not without compensation um, for two German vessels, okay, forced to abandon their mission and return to base, um, you know, because the Royal Navy floods that area and the Scharnost and the Gneiser now have to make a hasty retreat, um, you know, um, away from the British Navy. And, you know, French and British ships hunt for them, you know, um, including 15 ships, but they do not manage to find them. Um, on November 26th, the Russians demand the withdrawal of Finnish troops from their border. Now, it's just interesting this because, you know, the Soviets have been trying to have these negotiations, you know, for border um, border changes, um, territorial cessations. But actually, the USSR attacked very quickly, which means um, the USSR had already got their troops and armies in position. And I think that the USSR always plan to attack Finland. I think that the USSR would be probably reaching out on a hope that Finland would accept, but probably accepted that Finland was never going to accept the territorial um, annexations and changes. And I will go through what those changes were. And they were quite, you know, important to Finland. And on November 30th, okay, the Soviet army officially um, invades Finland as a result of negotiations um, breaking down. But the negotiations only broke down the day prior on November 29th. So to say the Soviet army launched multiple attacks on Finnish border shows that they were uh, they had been there weeks, that they got the supply lanes built and um, working, that they got all their equipment there, moved their armies there. So they'd been planning that for a long time. So, okay, let us go through now. Um, the German pocket battleships, okay, didn't have great success, um, you know, at the start. You know, the Deutschland, um, who left port on October 24th for a first cruise in the War Atlantic to attack shipping, um, had only sunk two merchant ships, grossing 7,000 tons um, by the time she returned to port. Now, it's after she returned to port, okay, that Hitler ordered um, that the Deutschland be renamed the Lutzow, okay, because, it, like I said earlier, he didn't want to lose a ship um, that bared the name of the Fatherland. Now, in the South Atlantic, the Graf Spee was off. Um, Pernambuco, okay, uh, which is in Brazil, um, when on 20, September 22nd, a commander, Captain Hans Langsdorff, received the order to commence operations against Allied merchant shipping. 
Now, the Graf Spee's run, okay, lasted nearly 80 days. Okay, at one point she was near the Indian Ocean. Um, she sank altogether nine merchant ships, like 55,000 tons of shipping um, from those nine merchant ships. Okay, and then by December 13th, the Graf Spee was found heading, okay, for the shipping folks of the River Plate. Um, Graf Spee's lookout sighted um, Commodore H.H. Howard South Atlantic Cruise Squadron, which immediately prepared to give battle. Okay, this is the Battle of River Plate. Now, as shown on the video for the Graf Spee, giving its statistics, the German warship had six 11-inch guns and eight 5.9-inch guns, and it was a heavy modern ship. Not as heavy as some of the British battleships, as you will see when I upload the Royal Oak video, with its stats but basically its armaments were way too much okay for the cruisers employed um, namely the cruisers Exeter um, Ajax and Achilles great names uh, which between them only had six eight inch guns um, for the Exeter and 16 six inch guns on the Ajax and Achilles okay um, also important to state the Graf Spee had deeper armor um, than these ships and thus um, was more than a match for them so, um, it took time, okay, for Ajax and Achilles to get into position, um, and this basically allowed Langstorff, um just preparation time, okay, for his first shells, okay, and to concentrate um, his big guns fire. And basically, the fire of his heavy guns, okay, completely wrecked the Exeter, okay. All the Exeter's guns were knocked out in the shelling. Um, she was flooding, she was starting to sink. Um, but basically, with heroism, okay, the captain kept fighting as long as he could even though the ship was made an absolute mess um you know even launching torpedoes um until the exeter um had to fall out of the battle um with big billows of black smoke coming from her now the ajax and achilles okay continued to fight um but they were trying to get close enough to do damage to graf spee the thing with the graf spee's armaments is that it was a much heavier warship and armed with larger guns and its guns had a larger range so the british cruisers um had to get into a much shorter range for their weapons to have much effect against the Graf Spee's thicker armour. So that put the British cruisers right in the middle of hell, okay? Uh, the Graf Spee's 11-inch guns firing over and over, um, you know, took out most of Ajax's guns, um, you know, and should now lost um, and used up um, over half her ammunition. And the Graf Spee was completely undamaged. So the Ajax and Achilles, okay, the Ajax heavily damaged. Um, you know, the Exeter was pretty much a floating wreck. So the Ajax and Achilles broke off the action um, in the morning just prior to 8 o'clock and had to retire. Now, Captain, Captain Langstorff at that point had a decision to make. Okay, he had lost, okay, in killed and wounded nearly a hundred of his crew. Um, his ship had not actually um, suffered any major damage, um, but the Graf Spee had suffered some minor damage, um, you know, and that basically made Langstorff think, you know what, um, we should actually go um, to Montevideo, okay, um, to repair any damage and let my crew have a rest. Now, this was the big mistake because heading for Monte Montevideo Harbour uh, effectively put the Graf Spee into a trap where when it came out, now it would be waited for, you know, by the um, British South Atlantic fleet. So the Uruguayan authorities, okay, um, basically had pressure put on them by the Brits, okay, um, to put a condition on Langstorff, um, captain at Graf Spee, that he could only stay in Montevideo for three days, okay. Now that tied with international law at the time, um, because Uruguay was neutral in the war and had not named um, which way they would be going. So basically, it left Langstorff with no choice, okay. He could do some repairs, um, let his crew rest um, for three days, um, but they could never finish all the minor repairs, and then he would have to go out. Okay, um, into the Atlantic and basically um, face off against the British fleet. Now, by this time, okay, uh, the UK um, had aircraft carriers there okay um they had the ark royal uh, there was a british battle cruiser renowned to add to the other ships there they were now waiting for the graf spee um as soon as it left montevideo harbor um so basically okay captain langsdorff um basically did not want to go out and he did not want to go out and submit his crew to being killed okay so basically 
he scuttled the ship, okay, he shot himself on December 20th, wrapped in the German flag, okay, and thus ended the Battle of River Plate. Now, the Graf Speer had shown that although more advanced than the British cruisers and heavy cruisers, um, and also it showed that on fight for fight against the British cruisers, the Graf Speer and the German pocket battleships would be too much, they were still haunted by the numbers of British ships. You know, Britain had way more heavy cruisers, battleships, carriers, you know, the, um, like the Renown, um, basically, and the carrier Ark Royal. The Ark Royal had aircraft. They could launch aerial attacks on Graf Speer. And even though the Graf Speer had anti-aircraft guns, you know, Britain's torpedo carrying planes would have been a major risk, coupled um, with the, um, you know, um, ship attacks as well. So, basically, okay, the threat to convoy routes, okay, by the German pocket battleships, we've read about the Scharnost and the Gneiser now, they came out and sunk a few merchantmen before managing to evade the Allied fleets and head back to port, then the Graf Spee in the South Atlantic, you know, um, taking on an effectively winning battle um, against the British ships of the time, um, you know, before being scuttled by its captain which Hitler was not very happy about, I'll just say. You know, left the Germans in a position where their ships, you know, were more vulnerable. The Royal Navy just had two numbers. Now, the French battlecruisers Dunkirk and Strasbourg and three um, French cruisers, okay, joined the hunting groups, okay, around these areas, okay, in the South Atlantic. Um, you know, the battleship um, Richelieu, I will, of course, um, cover in a future start video. So basically by this time the French were also getting involved, they were getting their navy out. Now of course um, when it comes to it after the invasion of France I will talk about the um, problem of Messer al -Kabir. We, I believe it's Mesa al Kabir, if I remember, and that was where the British Navy, after the fall of France, decided, do you know what? Uh, France has a battleship Richelieu. They have lots of shipping um, warships that could turn the balance against us, help turn the balance against us at sea. So basically, the British attacked the French ships. We will cover that um, in a future video. So. Before we go any further, okay, let us um, turn a little bit of attention, okay, to the magnetic mine and the problems um, that that caused, you know, um, by Admiral Raider and the German Navy. Now, for first months at war, um, the magnetic mines caused a lot of damage, okay. They were dropped from aircraft or they could be laid by U-boats, okay. It were detonated um, once metallic mass of any ship or anything like that came near it. It would fix onto it then explode and they caused a lot of damage um, you know between November and December 1939 59 allied and neutral ships over 200,000 tons of shipping was sunk by magnetic mines alone okay but then on the night of November 22nd 23rd a German aircraft dropped a magnetic mine off Schuberiness okay in Thames estuary uh, this landed on a mud flat and was discovered okay so the UK captured a magnetic mine the work to defuse it once they work to defuse it, you know, they actually then start to figure out how does this mine work. Now, over it, okay, succeeded a magnetic mine gave up its secrets. Now, once these were known, okay, ships begun to be degaussed as a protective measure. Now, degaussing um, involved running a cable around the ship and passing an electric current through it, okay, which neutralized um, the ship's magnetic field. So the magnetic mines would not be able to hone in on the ship's magnetic field and then explode causing damage okay so it was a bit of a fluke okay that a magnetic mine were dropped recovered in low tide they managed to diffuse it take it apart figured out how it worked and then figured out this simple system okay of running a cable around the ship making the ship have a very dull or non-existent um, magnetic field which again, you know, along with um, along with sonar, along with radar, were another great British um, kind of triumph at that time. So let us now also look at another incident. Okay, another coup pulled off by Germany um, during just throwing that in bin during the um, early stages of the war. Now the numerical advantage, like I've gone through, was already heavily against Germany. Okay, and. Two weeks, okay, on September 17th, okay, the U-29 under Commander Otto Schuhart, you know, sank the first Allied ships, okay, in World War II. Um, and those ships were the elderly aircraft carrier Courageous, um, which displaced over 22,000 tons and over 500 of her crew were lost. Now, also in these initial battles at sea, um, basically on the night of October 13th, 14th, Okay, um, Lieutenant Commander Gunther Prien, okay, took his U-boat, U-47, through the maze of channels and currents girdling the stronghold at British Home Fleet, 
okay, at Scapa Flow um, in the Orkneys. Now, Scapa Flow was deemed to be um, impassable to U-boats. They'd built underwater lanes, defences, walls. So the idea was that no U-boat would be able to actually, um, you know, pass um, into Scapa Flow. But this brilliant German U-boat commander, uh, Gunther Prien, and U-boat 47 actually penetrated, okay, penetrated the defences of Scapa Flow and once inside, fired three torpedoes at the British battleship Royal Oak, um, a battleship that displaced over 30,000 tonnes, um, as you'll see on its stat video, much, not a really too much bigger ship, but a much bulkier and heavier um, warship than the Admiral Graf Spee. So the loss of that, okay, um, and the loss of that ship with over 800 crew, okay, the ship capsized, capsized and sunk in um, 12 minutes. Now, the Royal Oak was a famous ship in the British Navy, and it was a blow, um, you know, to the UK Navy. And even after that, you know, um, the UK refused to accept that a German U-boat could have penetrated. And at times they launched investigations and even pointed fingers um, in case there was someone who had given the German U-boat the underwater plans to scap a flow so they could penetrate. But actually, Gunther Priam was a brilliant U-boat commander. And, you know, he carefully manoeuvred through the canyons um, and, like I said, sunk the Royal Oak, which is a major um, blow to the British Navy. Uh, the Royal Oak as well was a heavily armed ship. Um, I will cover both U-47 and the Royal Oak um, in a later video. But some of these murmurings were the first murmurings of the war at sea. OK, the war at sea started out with the attacks on merchant ships, the U-boats going out, the deploying of magnetic mines that Britain, you know, over those first months um, got around and conquered th thanks to capturing one. The Battle of River with the Exeter, Achilles and Ajax against the Graf Spee, the scuttling of the um, Graf Spee in the edge of Montevideo Harbour um, and Captain Langstorff committing suicide in the German flag, you know, and the failure of the Scharnost and the Gneisenau to really, you know, make a huge impact on Allied merchant shipping um, and their return to port kind of left the German Navy stagnant um, at the beginning. Now, on November 23rd, okay, the battle cruiser Sean Austin and Gneiser now, um, you know, they um, annihilated the Raoul Pindy, um, like I mentioned, okay. Um, but basically, um, Sir Charles Forbes, um, commanding own fleet, were unable to put to sea and intercept these new raiders. Um, September 9th, he had to shift um, his base from Scapa Flow until the de defences there and the aircraft as well as anti-submarine had been put to rights. That, of course, was in relation to U-47 uh, under Gunther Prien penetrating and sinking um, the Royal Oak with over 800 of her crew. Now, the Germans soon got wind of own fleet's change of base, okay, and the quickly laid magnetic mines um, in the approaches to Lock U, okay, on December 4th. Uh, one of them damaged um, the battleship Nelson um, that she was out of action for months. Just one magnetic mine damaged the battleship Nelson. She was out for months. But, you know, despite all this, okay, the Royal Navy still held um, the ace calling card in the war at sea, okay, but those are some of the initial naval engagements of World War II. I'm on my third part video, 40 minutes, and I haven't even got out of 1939 yet, and the war only started in September. So it kind of tells you how many parts are going to be in 1940, and especially 1941, with the opening of Pearl Harbor, um, the great East invasion to me of all time, Barbarossa. The campaigns, okay, in um, Greece... Um, and Crete and Yugoslavia to come. So all of that is to come, okay, um, in 1940 and 1941, of course, the invasion of France, etc. So let's go through the events up to the end of the year. Let's go through the major events up to the end of the year. Then I'll turn to the Winter War, what is known as the Winter War. So, on November 30th, the Soviet army invades Finland, okay, it concentrates its assaults on the Karelian Isthmus, um, Helsinki is bombed, but the Finns, okay, are very skilled winter warriors, the Finnish army, we'll go through some of the numbers for the uh, combatants on both sides, but the Finnish army was way smaller, okay, way smaller um, than the Russian forces, the Russians had mass forces, but the Soviets had other problems as well that we'll talk about, in fact, um, right now, so, we'll talk Talk about the next two things. One, what were um, the Russian conditions imposed, okay, on Finland? And, you know, what is the problem that I think really hurt Stalin on his um, attacks on Finland? Um, a real major blow to the Red Army, what we will discuss. 
So, what were the conditions, okay? What were the conditions imposed on Finland? Well, condition one, okay, was that Finland was to cede her islands in the Gulf of Finland. You see, the Soviets, by this point, as we've seen in some of the Baltic countries, they are after ports, they are looking after territory for advanced air bases. They are looking for territory that can help expand um, their influence at sea, basically. You know, giving them naval ports to build shipping, giving them um, airports near naval ports so their aircraft can now start p- to patrol. Basically expanding the Russian Navy's sphere of influence, even though the Navy was not all that great. But Finland were to cede her islands in Gulf of Finland. Um, point two was Finland was to withdraw her frontier in Karelian Isthmus between the Baltic and Lake Ladoga, okay? Third, okay, an aeronaval, an aeronaval base at Hango, um, at the mouth of the Gulf of Finland, to be leased by Finland to Soviet Union for 30 years. So the USSR wanted um, an air and naval base handing over to them for 30 years. You see, it's all about expanding fear of influence. The fourth condition was Finland was to cede to Soviet Union her portion of the Rybaki Peninsula and Lapland. Okay, so two regions in Finland were to be seceded, uh, handed over to the USSR as well. Um, and then point five was um, a mutual assistance treaty Okay, and between the Soviet Union and Finland for defense of the Gulf of Finland. So basically what the Soviet Union is after here is advanced air and naval bases in the Baltic Sea, okay, and other areas. And also then, to conclude all that, territorial cessations and annexations, etc., they also wanted Finland to guarantee them that they would lend to defend the Gulf of Finland, which is quite ridiculous, really. (laughs) You know, quite ridiculous, really. Uh, but that was partially as well to protect the new naval bases that wanted um, had in the Baltic countries, okay, to provide air cover, to provide naval cover um, in a more, so they could pretty much seal that area off and dominate that area. So those were the conditions laid down. Now, obviously, okay, um, the Finnish were never going to agree with it. Now, the thing is for the Finnish army, okay, um, the thing is for the Finnish army that They were not very large, okay? They only had like 19, 20 infantry divisions and a small number of tank brigades. The Finnish army um, was not very large, okay? Now... The Soviet army, by comparison, in Karelian Isthmus, okay, the 7th army, um, comprised eight, inf- eight um, infantry divisions, um, a tank corps, and two tank brigades. Now, tank brigades are something still used by many powers. Now, as we know, Guderian um, were one of the foremost voices um, in arguing um, to German high command in tactics of Blitzkrieg to concentrate their panzers into divisions, um, which gave them much more hitting power um, than the smaller tank brigades. That was one change that Germans made. The average German panzer division at start of war generally included about 320 tanks, whereas tank brigades could include anything from 65 to 180 tanks. So the panzer divisions were a much more heavier armoured unit and thus were much more successful um, at breakthroughs, whereas in World War I, the lightning war launched by Ludendorff um, and, and these generals at the end of the war with using the shock troops in conjunction with tanks and aircraft in a fast artillery bombardment Aircraft strikes, tanks moving through with infantry to try and quickly get through lines. Well, we're like an early form of Blitzkrieg in a way. But the Russians still employed tanks in an infantry support role. You know, you'll often see footage of Soviet tanks moving and Russian infantry moving with them. The Germans had changed the rule book a bit. So that was what was facing the Finns in the Karelian Isthmus. Eight um, infantry divisions, a tank corps and two tank brigades. Now on east shore of Lake Ladoga, okay, the Russian 8th Army had six divisions um, and was also to assist the um, Russian 7th Army around the um, Karelian Isthmus region on the other side of Lake Ladoga. Ladoga. And in central Finland, okay, the Russians had the 9th Army, um, that was in four divisions. Now, one column were, made, were to make for Ulo um, and the right for Kemi, okay. And then the 4th Army, um, Lapland, which was the Russian 14th Army, had one division, okay. It was to take Petsamo um, and sever um, northern Finland's communications with Norway. Now, the Finns, by comparison, okay, in the Karelian Isthmus, they only had five divisions, okay, under um, commander of General Hugo Osterman. Um, on the east shore of Lake Ladoga, okay, they had two divisions. So, basically, in the Karelian Isthmus, they had five divisions to Soviet, eight divisions, a tank corps, and two tank brigades. Um, on the east shore of Lake Ladoga, the Finns only had two divisions um, under Major General Hagland, um, whereas the Russians, okay, had six divisions, okay, so a way larger force. 
In central Finland, okay, they only had nine battalions under General Vilpo Tuompo, um, whereas in central Finland, okay, um, the Russian Ninth Army had four full divisions, okay, facing those nine battalions. Um, and in reserve, okay, the Finns had um, two partially formed infantry divisions and a cavalry brigade. So basically, the Finnish army could mobilize about 110,000 troops at the start of the Winter War. The Soviet army was estimated um, at over 300,000 troops. But two things affected the initial outcome of this war before um, round two in 1940. Point one was the Finns were highly skilled winter fighters. They were highly trained on skis. Now, that may, me, may seem silly, but when tanks are logged and can't move and infantry are moving, f- soldiers moving on skis are way more um, fast-moving and organised. And the Finns were highly skilled on skis. Many Soviet troops were. That is something silly, but actually was something really, really important. And then, you know, those temperatures could do, go down to minus 30, minus 40. The Finnish army was highly trained in winter warfare. Not surprising considering, you know, Lapland, etc, etc. The other major problem, and I think this problem not only affected Russia um, at this time, but also affected them later in the war when it came time to facing off against the now very battle-experienced German army in Operation Barbarossa. And that was Stalin's purge of the Red Army. Now, many people are not really aware of this, but Stalin, um, after he came to power, did a huge purge of his military command structure, okay? Because certain old generals, um, captains, commanders could possibly be a political threat to him due to their influence with their war experience. So, Joseph Stalin, okay, check out this purge, okay? He purged three out of his five army marshals, okay? Thirteen out of his 15 generals the USSR had were purged. 80, 57, sorry, out of 85 corps commanders and 110 divisional commanders out of 194 divisions were also purged, okay? And 220 out of 406 brigade commanders were purged. That means over 400 ranking officers in Russian army were purged in lead up to end of 1938 out of just over 700. So that's over half of the command staff of the Russian army were purged. Now, this left a problem to many of the new people coming in had not experienced war. Many of them were fairly novice, okay? Stalin put his people into positions of power. But this purge of over 400 of his main commanders, divisional commanders, field marshals, generals, out of 700 meant suddenly the combat experience of his commanding forces in the Russian army was severely weakened. That purge, I think, not only hurt the Red Army in Finland, but also hurt the Red Army in 1941 against the Germans in Barbarossa. And I have no doubt of that whatsoever. So let us go through, okay, let us go through some of the events of the Winter War. Uh, This may spill over into the second, um, of course. So, okay, by end of 1939, okay, in the Karelian Isthmus, okay, a front of nearly 90 miles, the Soviet 7th Army was completely pinned. The Finns had employed clever traps, okay, that laid traps for Soviet tanks and infantry, pillboxes, you know, um, um, wire everything. The the Finns had built an elaborate defence system that completely stopped in its tracks um, the Russian 7th Army, even though they greatly outnumbered the Finns. You know, the Finns had pillboxes, anti-tank traps, infantry traps, you know, the set actual entire traps for infantry units to fall into, where they could be you know, destroyed and attacked from multiple sides. The Finnish army was very clever. So the Soviet 7th Army was stopped in its tracks. The Soviet 8th Army, you know, which was on the other shore of Lake Ladoga, they got even bad, okay? Two whole divisions um, reached Tolvajari uh, on December 12th. They were ambushed and destroyed, okay, by only seven Finnish battalions under Colonel Talvela, okay? The Russians lost over 5,000 dead in that engagement alone. In central Finland, okay, the Russian 9th Army um, advancing on Ulo um, were counterattacked, okay, by um, Silavaso's detachment of Finnish troops. Um, December 11th, okay, um, one Soviet infantry division were destroyed, Um 
you know, one was cut off um, and another was destroyed trying to tree. So basically the Russians were walking into a, a very clever, um, elaborate defense system set by the Finns. So even with their shorter numbers, you know, the Finns could absolutely inflict massive damage. Now, in the first stages of the Winter War, um, Russia had lost... Uh, Finland had lost, sorry, as little as 3,000 dead and wounded. Okay, the Russians had lost nearly 30,000 soldiers already. That's like a ratio of 10. For every Finnish soldier lost, you know, 10 Russian soldiers were lost. And the Russian soldiers were very brave, very tough, very resilient. But they were not experienced as the Finns in fighting in those um, age-cold temperatures. Now, we will actually come back to the Winter War in part two. Let's just go through some final events um, here um, before closing out this video. Part four um, hopefully should come tomorrow. So let's close out some events by end of year. Okay, on the 4th of December, um, a magnetic mine damages the battleship Nelson, um, you know, and also the Allied Navy's lost two destroyers um, and two damaged um, you know, in that time as well. On 5th of December, okay, the Russians reached the Mannerheim Line, uh, garrisoned by the second Finnish Army Corps. And that is where I will leave part three. Part three I have gone through, okay, very quickly, and we shall continue in part four. But there is part three of my complete um, World War II. Um, we will cover the rest of the Winter War and then the actions leading up to um, the campaign in Norway and Denmark. So this is um, Ultimate World War II. I'm out for now.